Buenos días a todos. Vamos a proseguir con la segunda sesión de la mañana. Y la sesión está programada en inglés y las eh, exponentes van a hablar en inglés, pero el coordinador sigue hablando inglés como los indios de las películas, así que habla en castellano. <risa> Eh, supongo que me han invitado a coordinar esta mesa por el título que ven en pantalla. Puede ser que el segundo título también tenga alguna relevancia, pero me voy a re referir simplemente a la que está programada. Eh, vamos a exponer según el orden establecido en el programa. La primera exponente es Cecilia Más, es licenciada en Historia por la Universidad de Buenos Aires, miembro del Colegio de Graduados Global Intellectual History. Doctoranda en Historia en la Freie Universität Berlin, eh, dirigida por Stefan Rick. Y el, la tesis que está trabajando es The Global Entertainment Industry in Latin America, Max Glucksmann at the Organization of Culture. Max Glucksmann es un personaje muy interesante que muchos hemos mencionado, pero supongo que Cecilia está profundizando más de lo que sabíamos hasta hoy en día. El título de la ponencia de Cecilia esta mañana es Movies for the Modern Nation, Jewish Immigrant and Film Production in Argentina, Chile and Uruguay, 1819 and 1920s. Okay, I'm luckily tall enough to, to stand here. I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to take part um, at these two days. It has been very interesting. Um, as you may see, I made a small change uh, in my title and also the working title of my dissertation that was just mentioned. It's also not uh, the current title, um, but um, I will move, move to the content rather than the titles. What I'm presenting now is a part of my, of my PhD dissertation, which I am in the process of writing at the moment. So in this regard, I'm more than, than thankful for all uh, comments and critics. Um, the main goal of my, of my dissertation is to look at the introduction of the technologies of the motion pictures and recorded sound in Latin America, specifically in Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay, and to observe the process through which uh, new media emerge and the industries of, of film and record are formed. Um, and out of the many possible ways of approaching this topic, I decided to, to focus on, on specific actors and their role, um, rather than focusing on the national cases. Um, so the main case study I'm looking at, although not, not the only actor, but the main, the main act actor I take as a case study is Max Glucksmann, who is known uh, to many of you, but I will still introduce him because it might not be known to, to, uh, to everyone. Um, uh, Max Glucksmann was a, a, a Jewish immigrant in Buenos Aires. He arrived there in 1890. Um, and became one of the main, uh, he started working in a shop uh, that sold photographic products and he became one of the main uh, entrepreneurs or businessmen in the fields of film and, and the music industry. He's mentioned usually as a pioneer of Argentine film, he's also mentioned in the histories of tango because he worked together with Carlos Gardel um, and he's also mentioned for his role in, in the Jewish community. Um, my impression is that even though he's mentioned lots of times the what, what we actually know about him is not that uh, broad. Um, but more than that, what I was interested in is how he, his figure, his trajectory can work as an entry door to look at very specific and, and sometimes not enough analyzed aspects of the history of these two industries and of the history of cultural production. So after a lot of thought, I decided not to, not to write a biography, but to use him as an entry door, as, a, as a, something that goes through my dissertation while the focus is on the history of this, this media and of cultural production. Um, I think that, that what this allows me to do is to observe uh, strategies, how, how these actors uh, de face challenges and develop strategies uh, for, their, yeah, for their commercial purpose. And I think that this, strategies are not only 
commercial, I would say, even though he was a businessman, he was running a business. Sometimes these strategies combine and, and make use of, of, of his social position, of his social networks, where ethnicity also plays a role. So the way I see it in my, in my dissertation is that I have, there's two things that interest me. Um, one is, um, so what was the role of these immigrant entrepreneurs and that migration networks in the history of media, but also how playing a role in this media and having access to cultural production might have been part of the strategies of immigrants to define their own position in the society. Um, so I must say it was particularly helpful, but, but also challenging to, to prepare this presentation at this point of, of my writing process, um, because this is not something that is a chapter of my thesis, but it's something that uh, it's present in all of them. So it sometimes plays a pro more prominent role and it's sometimes more on the background. Um, so since I am I'm following a, a media history approach to this, to this thesis, I, um, I divided my, my, my dissertation in three chapters that focus the first one on the sphere of, of commercialization and consumption, the introduction of, of technologies, the second one in distribution, and then at the end on production, on the actual contents of, of uh, yeah, movies and records. Um, so the first, um, the first thing I look at is at um, how um, these shops, for example, where, where Glucksmann worked, Casa Lepage, which was a, um, a shop specialized in photography, what was the role in the introduction and appropriation of what were at the moment the latest novelties, the latest technological novelties of the time? Um, Glucksmann started working in this quite yeah, small or medium-sized shop. He was then left in, ch in charge of the shop, uh, which was then named after his name, Max Glucksmann, and he bought it in 1908 and led a, a very uh, fast expansion, which led him to open branches in, in different cities of Argentina, Chile and Uruguay, and an office in New York. Um, and started to focus not so much on photography, but mostly on, on, on yeah, film and photography. Uh, film and phonography, sorry, words are quite similar. Um, so my idea is that, that the, co the selling strategies of this technology had an important role in shaping what were the uses of this technology. And in order to do this, it was required a, a great amount of, of knowledge about what were the, the demands, the expectation of potential users. Um, so I think that in this regard, the fact that this was destined main, mainly to an urban um, market where a large amount of the population were migrants also played an important role in many ways, at least in two. I have here two examples. One of them is the fact that the publications, the press of, of migrant communities was an important medium through which advertisements were published and the access they had was of course uh, different in terms of, of to which uh, uh, community they belong. So Glucksmann was publishing in Mundo Israelita quite often, while other immigrant Italians or Spanish Italians were publishing in, in others. Um, and then, of course, there are um, products that are especially target for immigrants, and this is especially relevant during World War I, World War I um, where the record industry, for example, made an important use of, of um, well, patriotic songs, and they destined patriotic songs that were sung in the language of the migrant community. So these were also products target for, for migrants. Um, the second aspect I, um, I focus on is distribution. And these people, for example, Glucksmann, are mostly known for being producers, but actually the most relevant, where they make the most, <laughs> most money and what uh, they dedicated most of the time was to act of, as distributors. So it might be um, in, in, yeah, in, the, in the study of these topics, I think is the less uh, sexiest part because you have to look at the most boring sources and it is quite often uh, not so much examined. But um, actually the evolution of distribution networks is what explains to a large extent um, how also how production worked because we're talking about markets where the presence of films and records produced in Europe and the United States was quite overwhelming. Um, so I see that these networks were at first very informal and unstable to some extent and these entrepreneurs 
had access to movies on, on irregular basis and records and the technologies were not imported on, on, on regular terms either. But with time they consolidated. And something Luxman did was to spend a lot of time traveling in, in Europe and the United States uh, signing the agreements to have access to the distribution rights of the main uh, film studios and record companies. Also by having a um, yeah, a structure of a family company. He himself, his firm, had a, a regional structure in Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay, and, and his brothers were in charge of each of the, each of the branches in, in Montevideo, in Santiago, and one of his brothers uh, was in charge of the office in New York. Um, and in the 1920s, he was probably the, mo the main um, distributor in Latin America, in South America, at least not only this, in these three countries, but also owing the rights for, for Paraguay, um, uh, Bolivia, and Peru of many studios. And that got him a lot of opposition. So um, the owners of movie theaters were not very pleased. They accused him of being... Um, a monopolistic that wanted to control the whole business and they used a, a certain a different uh, types of arguments to oppose that. One were more in the, in the line of, well, competition is good, it will keep the prices low, so we should prevent him to have all the contracts. And the other one were more of a uh, type, like the one we see here. This was uh, published in Critica, which made echo of this uh, uh, boycotts and, and complaints against Glucksmann uh, quite often where he was portrayed as an immigrant who uh, had this trajectory of social ascent and all he cares about is money and he's also portrayed as a, yeah, as in, in a an, an rather anti-Semitic way uh, by calling him the Kimikointas and, and making fun of his broken Spanish. Um, hmm. Also, in regard of distribution, I think uh, the context of World War I um, deserves some special attention. Um, and as uh, Stefan's book has shown, uh, the propaganda war was one of the main aspects in, of, the war, of the way in which Latin America took part in the war. And as it, has, uh, as it can be seen, um, propaganda relied to a great ex extent also on private, on, on actors of the private sector, not only to produce the films that were partly designed and thought of by government officials, but actually made by studios, by Hollywood studios, who played a big role in film propaganda, but also distribution relied on private hands. And even though they were um, patriotic committees uh, that organized events and gathered funds and organized activities, it was quite clear seen that um, propaganda would be much more effective if it would reach uh, commercial uh, movie theaters. Um, and in this regard, I, I could find information that Glucksmann um, was show, uh, bought and was showing um, propaganda um, films from both sides. So he bought them from the German and, and, from, and from the US, um, probably following a very um, pragmatic logic, which is that there's audience for both, so why not? But of course, this was not very, very well received uh, by the people who were organizing the distribution of war propaganda. Um, and in case of, of the Germans, they, they asked the, the film company to stop working with him. And the arguments they used were, were, were three on kind of the same level. Um, he's a Jew. He nationalized French because apparently he had French nationality and also Argentinian nationality, um, which also had to do with how to travel around Europe. Um, and he collaborated with the Allies. Um, and in Argentina, especially in, in, in Critica, which published a lot on that, he was perceived as a representative of German capitals because he was of an Austrian origin. So here we see how him being an immigrant played an important role in, in how he was perceived from different, from different sectors. Um, and now moving to, to production. And I must say, this is the chapter I'm starting to write right now, so uh, it's a bit more uh, fresh, uh, and I will present some of my ideas and the possible directions I want to I want to go in. Um, so these these actors of these um, industries that were being born at the time, they engaged in production from a very early time, but in rather artisanal way. So they shot some of the first vista, so these movies with with a steady camera and they recorded cylinders that were recorded one at a time uh, by local artists. 
But these forms of production were soon marginalized or, or even interrupted when uh, records and movies started to arrive regularly from Europe and the United States. And local production emerged a bit after, uh, so it's not such a long of a, of a time uh, break, but it emerged what, the way I see it in very specific niches in which it was profitable or it was possible to compete with foreign, uh, with foreign production. And these contents usually tend to um, focus on, on, on an emphasis on, on local authenticity or even national identity. So in different ways, um, there is an emphasis in, 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 those, in those topics and it has been seen by the film historiography, of course, as a, having a, a large influence of nationalist discourses. So I think a question is how how these immigrants who were taking part in this, in this uh, field approached and contributed to, to, um, yeah, to shaping these nationalist discourses in these very specific media, which is not the same as the writings of, of people who would identify themselves as nationalists or, or, or as intellectuals. Um, so a broader look at, at Glucksmann produced a newsreel and, and many, many documentaries, and a broad look at his production shows, well, the, the main topics, the, the usual suspects of documentary film at that time, so many images of the cities and the new transports, of the government and their, and their acts and their, their events, inauguration of mo monuments, and I will, analyze some of those uh, my chapter, but now I wanted to focus on just one, which is how he portrayed the elites. Because Glucksmann himself had a very interesting relation to the Argentine elites. Um, in 1921, he requested to become a member of the Jockey Club Argentino, which was rejected. Um, but the, only, the, the fact that he requested it I think it already speaks of a self-perception as a member of the elite. And so thus, when one looks at his, at his patrimony and at, at his consumption habits, the, the part of the city where he lived, even the furniture he owned, the artworks he owned, the books he owned, um, show very much um, this self-perception. And of course, how much money he made at the time. Um, the main difference is that he never invested in land, as m most of the elites did. After he was rejected, he, he didn't accept the rejection, one could say, and he took part in a very important cultural project of the elites, which was building the Teatro Cervantes. And he contributed with the money that was missing in order to complete this, this uh, renovation and inauguration of this famous uh, theater. Um, so I think that I want to look at how he portrayed the elites. Um, for a matter of time, I just made snapshots of the, of, the, of the films, but these are actually films. Um, but also to how he portrayed the documentaries he made on Jewish institutions he belonged to because he had funded them or directed them or, or, was, um, or was close to them. And I, see, and I see that there's somehow a similar language, a very similar uh, representation as some kind of putting it on the same level on the tasks that these philanthropic activities, especially in, in the field of, of philanthropy, these philanthropics of the high society uh, were doing, such as the um, uh, inauguration of hospital, orphanages, etc. cetera. Um, cinco? Perfecto, sí. <laughs> um, and, the, and the other aspect is sociability. And, well, the image is quite bad, but these typical Sunday walks on the park, the houses on the countryside, the first one is of a, of a, yeah, a family of the, of, the, um, yeah, of the elites, and the, the second one is Glucksmann his, himself, with his family and friends. On, I, I know the image is not very good, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, quite, it's quite similar. So I wanted to look at that as, as, as a way of um, how the elites were being portrayed, considering his position in relation to them, but also this professional collaboration he had because he was hired to, to do many of the institutional propaganda, and also how this might also be a, a language for, for, for self-representation. And then moving to music, and this is my, my last point, um, Glucksmann's label was called uh, Discos Nacional. Um, he was first an agent of, uh, uh, of Odeon, and then he opened his own record factory in 1919 and founded his own label. And he, um, he launched um, his records under the, um, the label of Repertorio Criollo, 
um, which was the same label for, for the different countries, but then the, contact was, the content was uh, slightly different. So in Chile, there would be more emphasis on cueca, which was presented as the national music, and in Argentina and Uruguay, more on tango. But this was mixed with many, many other, many other musical genres. So, um, yeah, samba, gato. So what we would label under uh, folkloric music, but also um, maybe songs sung in, in 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 Italian or in other languages, and also some foxtrot played by tango orchestras. So if one looks at this repertorio criollo. Um, it's very, very broad. So what I'm interested in looking at is what what does this what what does the phonographic industry uh, and especially this this case whether it adds a layer to the meaning of criollo. So we we should remember that the discursos criollistas are very very important at that time and they're mostly present in in theater and literature. Um, but what what does it happen when we look at it from the perspective of the of the record industry? Um, so it seems to me like there's an idea of criollo being close to everything that's popular or to everything that's somehow local. So local appropriations of, of foreign music would would of original. I know that local and foreign are very are only analytical <laughs> categories. Um, this point, but also the fact that the record industry was was portraying the the criollo repertoire um, with very small association to the countryside. Actually, so this is just to give you some example of advertisements of the of this of this um, repertorio criollo. And the first one does have a gaucho in it, but the gaucho is listening to a gramophone. Uh, but the other ones, and there are many, many more. So this is the only one I can find with some some reference to to the to the campo or the or the countryside. Um, but most of them are des very clear destiny for for an urban population, and with no well, yeah, I don't know what to say about these images. With no evident or straightforward association to other of the references of of criollismo. Um, so. To conclude, I, I think this is part of what I want to explore on how, what did the technological but also the economic aspects of media add to, or how did they help define nationalist discourses? So what happens when we look not only at the influences of nationalist discourses in mass culture, but at the influence of mass culture in nationalist discourses, and how this technological basis, but also the economic uh, confirmation of this media can tell us about the history of, of nationalist discourses. And also, one, as one layer of that uh, problem being how can we assess the fact that many of the people involved are making the decision, but also gathering the knowledge in order to make this decision were immigrants themselves who were at the time uh, also developing their strategies and had their, their agendas to define their own role in, in the Argentine or Chilean or Uruguayan society. Thank you very much.